Hey fam, we are proud partners with Car Marshall. So if you or someone you know are looking for a new or used car, you can perform a nationwide search and it's free, 100% free. The best part is they help you find a car and actually negotiate the price for a hassle-free car buying experience. You can find the link in the video description box below to our channel sponsor, Car Marshall. Thank you, beautiful people. We appreciate your support. Good afternoon, my lovelies from Iron Sharpens Iron Council. This is Trey, and we're going to talk about how not to lose in court, <laughs> or at least how to maneuver through it without making things worse for yourself. So what we're going to talk today about is we're going to explain what it is that the court is trying to accomplish, what they do, and what you're doing that leads to your demise in pretty much every case I've seen thus far. Okay. So why are we talking about this? So I have analyzed and investigated, I don't know, maybe 10 cases over the last year or so. And in every case, there are similar issues at hand, similar methods being used. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit today. And then we're going to get into depth on, on what to do, what not to do, because it's really important to understand that there are many people out there who read a couple of books and believe that all of a sudden they know what they're doing in a courtroom. And this is the furthest thing from the truth. If you've never been in a courtroom, none of your paperwork's going to work. I'm going to tell you that right now. So before we engage someone in, in asking them to help us through a court situation, please find out before you do that, the first question you should be asking is how many times have you been in a courtroom? Um, you know, you, you, it doesn't work on paper the same way it works in practice. So when we're actually in there and we have this magical paperwork that some guru told us, we just got to file this and we're going to win. And then all of a sudden you're disappointed because it didn't win. What happens next is the guru tells you it's your fault. It's because you didn't know how to stand on it. <laughs> you know, let's just roll with that. Okay. Let's just say that's the truth. Um, if that were true, then we have to really sit back and analyze the situation. If I give you a piece of paper that has a bunch of mumbo jumbo legal information on it, if you cannot read it line by line and clearly understand what it says, how it is applicable to your circumstance and where it derives from, then it is likely not a good idea to file it. It's really just that simple, friends. If the person giving you this information has not spent time with you on the phone to explain to you very specific things, then you should run, not walk. Okay, so anyone who would be trying to help you, if they're going to give you some sort of legal paperwork or legal arguments or whatever, the first thing they should be doing is getting on the phone and they should be explaining some very bare minimum basic things to you. If they're not explaining to them to you, then I would suggest that it is likely they don't understand it themselves. <laughs> Keep in mind, we are on different venues where we're not seeing each other personally. You could be speaking to a 21 year old. You could be getting help from a 21 year old. You don't know. You could be getting help from someone who just newly got released from prison. Clearly he didn't win his case. So you don't know these things. So why would you take that leap of faith and go with something like this. It just boggles my mind. And the reason I'm bringing it up is because I am seeing it over and over and over again constantly. Typically, after a person has gotten help from someone, filed about 100,000 pieces of paper into their case, that's when they come to me saying, I'm stuck. None of this worked. I'm not sure what's going on here. I don't know what to do next. That's typically when I start hearing people ask me questions. <laughs> so. What are some of the very basic things you need to know about a person who's going to give you help, okay? Number one, we wanna find out what their experience level is. What types of arguments are they bringing to the table? Do they feel right? Does it fit? Does it make sense? Is it good? If you can't even comprehend what they're saying, then run, don't walk. Because if you can't comprehend what they're saying, this leads me to believe it is possible that the person is dictating and not really helping. So that's, that's just no good for anyone. But 
in addition to that, they may not really have a good understanding of things themselves. You hear so many different scenarios in here. I helped a, a, a couple recently and it was time consuming for me just to get on the phone with her, just to bring her back or snap her back into reality, which she never really quite came back. So here's the thing. This, this woman filed like six or seven different things into the court. You know, she got up in there using the various trust arguments that didn't work. So then she used the, it's a corporation argument that didn't work. All meanwhile, she's sitting in jail. This is not good, right? And she doesn't understand why they're not listening. So you cannot walk into an adversarial court and pound them over the head with the truth about 20 times. And on time number 20, they're going to say, ah, you got us. This isn't going to happen. I'm sorry. I know you want it to happen that way. But what you want and what is reality are two different things. So when we do these things, what happens behind the scenes that no other guru who gives you this kind of paperwork is telling you about? During the course of your filing all these paperwork, right? File paper number one, nothing happens. Maybe the judge ignores it, doesn't even get heard. Number two paper goes in, same thing. Judge ignores it, doesn't get heard. Number three gets in, now the judge is mad and yelling at you and you don't understand why. Number five is going in, the same thing. Everyone's mad, no one's really listening to you and they can't hear you and you are simply frustrated. What does this look like? If I were to come to your house and tell you that I wanna fix your roof, you say no. I come back and say, hey, if you let me fix your roof, I'll give you candy bar, you say no. I come back again and again and again, over and over and over. Now you're, now you're just annoyed with me. Now it's just annoying. And now it, what happens is they start playing with you. They start toying with you because they think you're funny. So that's what's happening when you're filing all these court papers that are ineffective and doing nothing for you because that is what the definition of insanity is, friends. When you keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result, this is what you're doing when you're filing into these cases like that. And it becomes uh, entertainment for the crowd, for the court. So a lot of times they'll start jumping up and down out of their chairs and seats and yelling and screaming, waving their hands and all these weird things are going on around you and you're getting even more and more upset as they're provoking you and invoking your emotions. It puts you into a deeper cycle of not being viewed for having a uh, very good logic and reason skills. It also puts you in a position where they can say pretty much absolutely that you're irrational. What does it mean to be irrational? It means that you're not really capable of going through this process on your own. So now you've also become dependent and now they take control. It's really just, it just happens that way. You don't have to like it. You don't have to agree with it. But I've seen it so many times over and over again that I'm telling you now. Every single case that I have put my little fingers into, every single one has raised some sort of trust. You're the fiduciary issue, you, you know, uh, filed tax papers, did all these different things that we hear about from all these different people. And so I took it upon myself to start analyzing and looking at it and seeing how it works and what it's all about. So case number one is a mortgage case. Many of these things were filed into the young lady's case and what was the result of that case? So they forced her to get a guardian ad litem for her husband. So that was the first part. Second, then after all, we get through all of that nonsense. The next thing is a new company moves in and then they start moving into foreclose upon these, these, these very, very kind people, by the way. Um, so now we're still operating in the, you know, it's, it's a trust, it's a bad thing, it's a corporation sort of thing, you know, this is what she's doing the whole time. And the court just moves and she's frustrated because they don't hear her. And she doesn't realize why that is. In the end, they are going to be foreclosing on her home. And it's really just the way it ended up. And I'm sad about that, really sad. But it's, it's these types of arguments that are ineffective, that's why. Uh, so now we have a person number two. She is also filing paper into the court, pointing out the fact 
that they are not able to uh, do what they're doing because they're a corporation is basically the overall idea. She then after that files this 99 page long, yes, 99 pages worth of legal arguments in an affidavit. First of all, legal arguments can't go into an affidavit, friends. If anyone's trying to give you something like that, run, don't walk. But now she's got this huge piece of paper. I can't believe it. The attorney actually responded to all 99 lines. I was shocked and I actually felt bad for the attorney that had to respond to it. But anyways, it did nothing other than get her a psych evaluation. And for the psych evaluation, she lost her child. Um, during the course of that, there was an issue going on while when, when they take your kids from, from uh, CPS or whatever takes your kids, you also then are required to pay child support for the children. So that was a secondary subsequent case that was going on. So once I got involved with her, we were able to uh, get the attorney general to withdraw her position in the case and vacate her uh, motion to collect child support. So that was a positive thing that happened and no corporate status was mentioned. No magical rainbows you know, were laid out before them. It just, it just was basic stuff. Real simple, actually. So she still wanted to go with the whole, it's a corporation argument. So we actually ended our relationship there because she just was convinced that somehow if she kept telling them they were a corporation that like Dorothy and she clicked her heels three times, it would get her home. I don't know what happened to her after that, sadly. Um, Another case comes in, same scenario. Uh, this is the, the most recent one. Uh, lots of trust documents and lots of, you know, it's a corporation arguments. So this person, this is really shocking to me. This is this one that kind of amazes me a lot. This person had received help previous as being on probation. The woman actually somehow, whatever she gave the probation officers, they stopped coming to see her, they stopped contacting her, stopped having their visits. I don't know all the details behind that. So uh, this happened like two years ago. Once all is said and done, she goes about her life, having a nice day, but it wasn't enough. She wanted more. I don't know what it is she was trying to accomplish, but she contacts them to get some, to, to let them know they're a corporation, I guess, to something in that realm. Um, and all this time that they'd been leaving her alone, she suddenly now is in the spotlight. This letter she sends them, beating them overhead with the corporate truth, ends her, lands her in jail because they sent a letter, the probation uh, director sent her a uh, the judge a letter saying that he believed she needed a psych evaluation and that he, she had mental health issues. So now she finds herself... Uh, being arrested for violation of probation and then catches a secondary charge uh, for resisting arrest. Now she is in uh, a whole new case with being in a correctional facility for where she is being held or detained because of the psychological problem. It may lead to her um, demise or the demise of the public if she has a, a, a psychosis going on. That's the idea of it. And that's why she's there, but she doesn't even know this. Um, she thinks she's just there in jail because of resisting arrest and that's, you know, they're not giving her a fair and meaningful hearing and all these other things. So what's really going on is they're holding her pending an, an investigation to see if she does have some sort of psychological problem. And if that problem is dangerous to let her go because she might do harm to the public. That's the idea behind it. And it is very difficult to accept this. It's very difficult to understand and, and to accept, I guess, because she now is filing all these crazy motions into the court. And the more she files, the observers around her, who's an observer? The judge, the defense attorney, the prosecuting attorney, the guards, uh, Anyone who, who comes to speak with you is observing your behavior specifically to see if you might be having some sort of behavioral health crisis. And if they believe you to be having a behavioral health crisis, they are very much allowed to keep you in custody before letting you go. They must find out if, if there's danger involved. They have to hold you. That's a responsible thing to do, right? 
They have to hold you until they can figure these things out. So that's why she's been sitting in there for several months by this point. And now it takes me a billion and one conversational hours to talk her off the ledge, so to speak. I had to ask her. So all these motions you filed about corporate this and trust that, which one of them effectively got you out of jail? None of them, obviously. Which one of them were effectively heard in front of the court where someone had been able to rebut them? None. Okay, so which one of them have effectively stopped them from taking you into a psychological custody or psychological ward? None of them. So if we know this is true, why would you want to file another piece of paper exactly the same as the last five or six that you filed? What would make this particular one more effective than those? There's no answer to that. And yet, she still want to file some stuff. <laughs> it makes no sense to me, but, you know, it's, it's like it comes with some finesse to talk her off the ledge here. You know, you got to kind of roll with the punches. You got to tell her, yeah, 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 you're right. I believe this. And then <clears throat> everything else kind of falls into place. Like, look, if you're going to get, be right, if, if, if what you want to do is to be right, then there's nothing anyone can do to help you because you're sitting in their room. I don't understand if, if people don't think about this clearly, but I hope you do after this. So you get into a room filled with people who went to law school for several years and have been practicing and are masters at legalese or masters at, um, at, at, at very, very strong arguments. And, and they have skills. This is a skill. This isn't natural. Okay. <laughs> so they, uh, accumulated these skills over years and they've worked very hard to accomplish this by the way so you know you can dislike them all you want but what you can't say is that they did not work their butts off to get to where they're at and now you come in there and you try to tell them how to do their job you tell them how it all works and presumably that what they don't know how it works is that not insulting does that not make someone feel combative instead of wanting to work with you like i mean think about if i come into your house and tell you how to do your thing in your house it's it's insulting so you you might think you know some truth you might have some really good truth in your hand but if it's not effective in getting you out of your circumstances why use it i mean i, I don't understand that concept but you know you hear people, oh, it worked for me, instantaneous. Yeah, I call bullshit. I've been looking to find someone who could show me evidence that any of this nonsense ever worked for them, and I have not come across anyone yet. But yet, people will still roll with that because it's easier. It sounds easier. It sounds good. So you can take the easy road, or you can take the effective road. And like I said, I have had many, many cases that have gone through my grip so i'm in a pretty good position to tell you it doesn't work and i'm sorry it doesn't work i wish it were that simple if it were that simple for you and i could make wave the magic wand and make it that way i most certainly would but that's my rant for today so now we're going to talk about now that we talked about what doesn't work <laughs> and why you're getting circular <laughs> hamster wheel logic in the courtrooms going on there uh, let's talk about what is uh, what is the truth versus what's, you know, magical, mystical, rainbow chasing nonsense. Okay, so is, is everything a corporation? Are there corporations in government? Yes. If you can't tell me how that will succeed in, in a case, I don't want to hear about it. Because, again, if, if the judge knows that it's a corporation and the attorneys knows that there's a corporation involved, a trust involved. They know all these things. What are you going to do about it? Tell them what they already know. And then what? So if you don't have a solution, you know, just doesn't make sense to use it. You, you can, you can think of it from that perspective, but now let's talk about the reality perspective, right? Here's how it looks. Let's talk about what it looks like. So, Everything the court is doing 
the officers and everyone else, they are trying to protect the public welfare. What that means is that if you are disorderly in public, you are disturbing the peace. And the reason that they consider that to be a disturbance of the peace is because your emotional outrage, your emotional um, disturbance being displayed will lead to the rest of the people getting upset about your behavior, whether they point you out and are scared that you're acting weird and want you, you know, to be looked at, or if it's simply you will get them riled up to believe and agree with you on something, either way you slice it, your behavior may lead to the public becoming um, uncomfortable, unhappy, and everyone has the right to happiness, liberty, right? So if your behavior is believed to be disturbing the happiness of the other people, well, then you have yourself a problem in your community. And that's why it's important to understand these things because this is actually the reality of the circumstance, not the magical rainbow chasing unicorn, okay? So let me just show you, I hope you guys can see my screen here real quick. Okay, so what we're going to talk about first is judicial power, right? Where am I coming up with this stuff? So this is actually what is called the Boilermaker Rule. And it explains to you what powers they have. It's very broad, by the way, um, and why and all of that. So we're going to go just a little bit into it. I'm not going to get too deeply about it. We're just going to kind of get through this. But if you've never listened to anything else before, I hope you're listening to this because this is, this is going to help you understand better what the courts are trying to accomplish, why you're in there. Because if you understand who, what, where, and why, then you can move forward to make an informed, better decision about how you want to proceed. So please pay attention, people, please. Okay. So limb one, the judicial power of the Commonwealth can only be vested in a chapter three court, including state courts vested with federal judicial power under the 77-3, okay? Only a chapter three court can exercise judicial power, includes federal court of Australia. Not a chapter three court if no mention of 72's appointment, not called a court, et cetera. Okay, so although this comes from Australia, their court system is, is the same as us. They have Department of Justice and everything like that, but this, the Australian version of explanation was just really better set out than what I could find in the States. So, and it makes sense because I can also establish um, various different cases in the United States that agree with this, this Boilermaker rule. So that's why we're using it. Uh, that's why I'm using it not to give you, you don't go and drop this into the courtroom or anything like that. This is just so that you can have a better understanding of what's happening. So here we call them Article Three courts. An Article Three court, most people already know, is a court, a constitutional court. It was created by the Constitution and it was given power to hear on matters involving matters of right, okay? Below those courts are tribunals, what you know as municipal courts, okay? These are different. These are not constitutionally created courts, although they may have some judicial power vested in them, they are merely statutory courts, meaning that the legislator created a statute. Typically that statute is nothing to do with protecting your constitutional rights, okay? And everything to do with keeping a level playing field so that all people's constitutional rights are not impaired, or abridged, or deprived based on the action of all the different people living in the community. Okay, I have a right to liberty, property, and happiness, and so do you. If we're all going to live together, my actions count as, to, to, as far as if you're protected. So uh, is my behavior going to interfere with your happiness? You have a right to happiness. So if my, my behavior is interfering with your happiness and somebody wants to stop me from, from doing that, then this is not where you're going to, you're not going to go into a constitutional court because your rights are not absolute in every sense of the word. Your rights are only absolute when you're not abridging someone else's rights. So now your, your rights have been reduced, okay, to, okay, you're interfering with someone else's happiness, someone else's peace. So now we're going to get involved with you and we're going to figure out if there's a way to uh, 
make amends between the two parties so that the other party can be restored back to happiness and you can be restored back to your liberty. Okay, so understand that when you go into a, a municipal tribunal, this is what they're trying to do. It's not about if your rights were violated or not. That is not what the issue at hand. They're addressing if your actions led to a breach of peace and therefore violated the rights of the community, okay? If someone cannot articulate this to you, run, don't walk. All right, so let's move forward. All right, so limb two, a federal chapter three court cannot be vested with anything other than federal judicial power. So in the United States, what we're talking about are your federally protected constitutional rights. You have two sets of rights. You have one from the Fed and you have one from your state, right? So you would have to get familiar with what your rights are, uh, which of your rights are protected within the state. Um, outside of due process, substantive due, due process, your rights are pretty much for the most part uh, workable because like I said, you, you have those rights, but you can only have them if you're not impairing the right of others. And this isn't just about injury and it's not just about damage. It's like I said, everyone has the right to happiness. So if I'm running around the neighborhood uh, screaming fire, 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 and there's not actually a fire, I have impaired the rights of my fellow man because I made them unhappy, uncomfortable and afraid unnecessarily. So now we have a problem. So this is where the police might come in and pick you up because they are worried that maybe you have a mental disability and that you'll keep doing that and that will lead to the community being unhappy. Okay, so that's what this is all about. Is the power validly conferred on that body? What is the nature of the power? To which, po which body is the power given? Apply the Boilermaker limbs to determine if it is valid. What is the nature of the power? judicial or executive in accordance with the first limb of boilermakers only a chapter three court can exercise judicial power okay it's an important statement here so what they're saying an article three court is the only court that can actually exercise the power from the judicial branch okay so let's make that clear the only article three courts that i know of that are in existence are the federal courts and obviously the supreme court of the united states uh, I think that the state Supreme Courts were supposed to be chapter three, or I'm sorry, article three, but you know, I haven't really delved into that very deeply. So <laughs> it's questionable at this point. I'm not real positive. All right. Difficulty arises in attempting to formulate a comprehensive definition of judicial power. According to the court identified in dicta of judicial power, indicators of judicial power. Okay. So power derived from sovereign authority means the body making the decision must have the power to make the decision by the actual law of the parliament, or in our case, the Congress, okay, or assembly in, this, in the state. <clears throat> not binding and authoritative as it was, not, bind, not binding of its own force, but required exercise of judici judicial power to enforce. So sovereign authority, so the people are the sovereigns as a body, okay, as a whole, but they have, delegated their authority to other categories of government to conduct certain businesses for them, okay? So when people talk about sovereignty and the people are sovereign, this is what it means. They are sovereign as a whole. But if we allowed everyone to be sovereign in a civilized community, <clears throat> that would mean I would have the freedom to run you over with my car. No one could do anything. That would be what a sovereign could do because I'm not subject to the law, right? So when people talk about sovereignty, I think that what they're not articulating well and what they really mean is that they believe in law and they want the law to exist. But at this point, the whole public safety issue has become nitpicky and, and way too penalizing. And, and I can't disagree with that. So, um, you know, I've, I've, like I said, I've analyzed and looked to see what it was all about, the sovereigns and sovereign citizens that people say, about, talk about, so to speak, and their various different ideas, you know. So if someone is saying anything about sovereignty, everyone seems to have a very different idea of what that means, you know, and, and this can cause for confusion. But just, you know, keep in mind that the power 
is derived from the people because the people as a whole are sovereign, but that does not give the people the right to impair or bridge or uh, deprive another person of their right. So this is why we have the secured liberty, property, and happiness interests, okay? A controversy about existing legal rights and duties, a matter. The creation of new rights will not satisfy this element. 75 and 76 is deal with the jurisdiction of the federal courts in respect of matters, must be resolving a matter. The court is a passive institution. They will not actively seek out dispute. The matter must call upon them to take action. Requirement of a matter is enforced in regards to the Judiciary and Navigation Acts. If there is no matter, there is no judicial power. Okay, and that's another important statement. So when we talk about the matter at hand, right? What matter is being brought into the court is basically some sort of controversy has to exist and that controversy must show that someone had a right and that that right was infringed upon before the court can even hear it, right? So if, if there is a controversy, say the state is uh, collecting revenue and that's the state's superior interest in uh, obtaining tickets, okay? It, it, is, it has nothing to do with public safety. This would be a matter that we would be able to bring into an Article Three court because the state would be abridging the rights of the public in order to collect revenue and not to protect the public, the members of the public, right? That would be the matter at hand. So we would raise that issue in a Supreme Court just because we wanna make sure we're addressing the merit of the case. What is, what is actually going on here? Interparts, the decision of the court will be reached with the parties present. They will be represented before the court and their submissions to the court will be heard. So this is just your basic constitutional right. You should already have this down pat. So you guys gotta be present, right? They do in tribunals, they don't always have parties present. What they do is a lot, a lot of uh, ex parte and emergency hearings, motions, and orders. Again, they cannot do this <clears throat> unless there is an, some sort of detriment to the health and well-being of someone in the public or the public as a whole, which is why that these particular courts are not Article Three courts because they're not hearing on a matter of constitutional right in that, in that way. What they're hearing about is whether or not your actions will lead to some sort of harm or damage. Basically, in a nutshell, it's risk management. Essential element of the judicial process is to resolve a matter, so need a binding and authoritative effect to actually enforce. This is uh, what you would think about uh, if someone has a right. Statutes are what, you, are what are utilized to establish a right. So a statute might say something like a party has the right to privacy uh, where their biometrical data is involved. Okay, and in my state, we do have an enactment like that. It's called the Biometric Data Protection Act. In this statute, it tells me that all of the members of the public have the right to privacy. And if someone's asking for their biometric data, that they also have the right to be fully informed as to what's gonna happen with that data before they give it up. This is the grant of a right in a statute. So if that right doesn't exist and there's no statute, no matter of law at hand, then I cannot go into court and complain in a tribunal, especially like I can't go in there and complain about nothing. All right. The tribunal can't help me. Now there has to be something that happened. Someone actually had to take my biometrical data before that enactment had been um, put into the books. Right. So it must have happened at some point. Someone's like, hold on, and it raises a question. This would be the matter. Can people just take your biometric data, biometrical data and use it? So what would happen next is that question would be raised in the Supreme Court so the Supreme Court can decide, is it, is it a violation of the Constitution? If the courts decide it is, now legislation will typically move to create an enactment that protects that right. So it's basically informing other, you know, corporate bodies that, hey, this person has a right to protect their data and you need to adhere to this. And if you don't adhere to it, this is what the punishment will be, okay? 
Note the decisions may be subject to appeal. The right to an appeal de novo will make a decision not binding and authoritative as it is essentially a new hearing. A strict appeal is more limited. You cannot submit new evidence. You can only attempt to find a legal error made by a previous decision maker. So to appeal something de novo means that they're going to hear the case brand spanking new as if nothing ever happened. So if you get a lower court that makes a decision a ruling that isn't favorable to you and you feel that it was incorrect or an error, you can uh, apply to get a de novo hearing so that the appellate courts will hear the case as if it just began. And now you have an opportunity to enter new evidence and all those good things, right? But if the courts, the lower courts do something to you that uh, you don't agree with uh, in a limited scope, so maybe they violated a due process issue, okay, due process right, you can do your appeal on that topic alone and nothing else. So you're just going to bring up that one issue. And then you would not be able to produce or submit any new evidence. The only evidence that the appellate courts will review is the evidence that was already entered into the court. So if you didn't make the record, if you didn't put in evidence, you cannot bring it up later, right? It's a, it's a one-shot thing. And this is where these uh, types of motions that are being filed are highly, highly dangerous. This is the worst of it <clears throat> right here in what I'm telling you. <clears throat> you only have a certain amount of time to make the record. And if you don't understand what it means to make the record, then you are pretty screwed, friend. But if someone comes in and tells you to file all these motions, telling the court what, it, what they are and what to do, you are missing a, an amazing opportunity to establish the record showing that the court is in error. You cannot establish that later. You must remake this record now. So while you're filing all these weird old documents, you've missed the boat in securing reasons to appeal. So this is why I'm highly recommending that if you are gonna receive help from someone, if you are going to keep studying and pulling various documents off of various places just to play with, Understand that while you're playing, you've missed a really good opportunity to pretty much close your case a heck of a lot faster. Uh, it doesn't make sense. You want to experiment on yourself? I guess that's your choice. Or you can just figure out what do we got to do to make the record and which issues are, appeal are appealable. And this is actually super easy. This is not hard. Performed in a judicial manner appropriate level of judicial discretion. Discretion must be exercised according to legal principle, not by reference to matters not specified by the legislature. So discretion is very broad. And this is where the judges have, um, in the tribunals, this is where they have a lot of immunity, meaning that if they have to use their discretion to make a decision, we are going to automatically give them good faith uh, credit by saying that we believe whatever they had to do was, you know, in their professional capacity and therefore it was the right decision to make, even if it was an error. You know, think of it as being like a doctor. You know, if a doctor wants to cut you open, every other doctor in the field would do the exact same procedures, right? They get you cleaned up. They get you, you know, some anesthetics and they all do see the same exact thing every day. But when a doctor is in the midst of getting this done, he finds you have a tumor in your stomach and he'd already cut you open. This is where he is now going to act outside the scope, but he is authorized to do so because if he proceeds, he doesn't know what to expect. So he has to make a quick decision on how to keep you safe, and it may require him to do things that are outside the normal practice, right? And he is protected utilizing his discretion to do such a thing, even if it causes injury to you, because someone in that moment has to make a, dis you know, a discretionary decision, right? Then how, how else are they gonna proceed? How can they be a doctor if we don't give them some leeway to make those kinds of decisions? We're putting our trust in them to do that. 
And that's what these judges are doing when it comes to discretion. It means that maybe, you know, it's not the normal circumstance. It's not the normal sort of case that they get. So they have to behave and do things in a different manner um, in order to make sure that justice is administered and that rights aren't violated. All right. In accordance with judicial process, RV Trade Practices Tribunal, ascertainment of the law as it is, determination of the facts as they, they truly are, application of the law as determined to the facts as determined. Okay. So this is your basic scope of practice, right? This is, this is what all the judges do on a regular basis. And this is how we can identify what they should be doing when they're not using their discretion in particular, right? Ascertainment of the law. I mean, that's obvious. De determining, determination of the facts as they truly are, not for what people proclaim they are. And this is more complicated than most people know. <laughs> so when we determine facts or when we're laying out the facts of a case, we have to be very careful and start really analyzing what the facts are. Okay. And a lot of times when you reach out to people that are trying to help you, they don't even know what facts are either. Okay. I've seen this in a lot of the cases where they're laying out all these purported facts and I could probably remove about half of them at least to say this is not a fact this is a conclusion so you know this is something that we have to be very careful on it sounds good on paper but it doesn't always make sense if you understand how to analyze it better okay so uh, now it goes into the judicial process under a judicial process for um what do you call it discretion right um so the judicial process but it must be it must not be of an arbitrary kind and it must be governed by some ascertainable test or standards so if a judge is going to utilize his discretion then there must be some sort of other case out there that has guided him to understand how to use that discretion in that particular circumstance okay or he has to apply some sort of test or standard. A test or a standard is something that they use on a regular basis to determine what to do next. So they will apply, say, the reasonability standard. Is it reasonable and is it just for me to take direction A or is it reasonable and just for me to take direction B based on what the facts are before me? Uh, this whole case is outside of the norm. So given what these people are saying to me, is it reasonable to believe that this person is incapable of running their own case? Is it reasonable for me to believe that this person is possibly insane or is possibly behaviorally disturbed? And all of this is what they're observing about you throughout the course of your case. So, you know, use some reasoning here. If you're filing a bunch of stuff that isn't effective and isn't applicable, if it doesn't make sense, or if it's in the wrong procedural method, then is it reasonable for a judge to make a determination that he can say, throw out all of your motions, right? Because I would say if, if it's mumbo jumbo and doesn't make any sense, yeah, it would be a reasonable thing. So if he uses his discretion to throw all your motions out, the upper courts are going to agree with him based on reasonability tests, okay? The result binding and authoritative decisions are from the non-discretionary side, not exclusively judicial attributes. Ensure quality before the law, impartial and independent ascertainment of the law. So that's, that's where we have the non-discretionary stuff, okay? I'm not gonna get too much into that because I could go deeply in explaining that. Um, some powers may be judicial or executive. Their nature depends on the body in which it is reposed. Common elements. A controversy about existing legal rights and duties, a matter. Ascertaining the law, determining the facts and applying the law to the facts, reaching a decision. Beyond these common elements, the chameleon power will take on the character of the body that it is reposed. So what's given to the courts is the judicial process, rules of evidence, binding and enforceable decision. Okay, so these are the powers that are given to the court. They can use that power to develop and ex execute judicial process, the rules of evidence, binding and enforceable decisions. 
okay, given to a tribunal is a flexible procedure. So they don't, they don't always have to follow the rules by the book, right? They're not bound to the rules of evidence often. So sometimes they may use, um, they may waive the rules of evidence. In some cases, I've seen that happen uh, altogether. Uh, not binding must be enforced by court action subject to judicial review. So not bound by rules of evidence. If you are in a court that is not bound by rules of evidence, therefore they say we are going to accept hearsay in this court or we are going to um, waive the rules of evidence in this case. That means it's a tribunal and not a court. And the tribunal has different powers that are given to them. However, those powers are given to them in a way that is not binding, which is why you're able to appeal, okay? Because whatever they decide at the lower court level or the tribunal is not something that it's not final. It doesn't end right there. It has to be enforced by court action, real court action, you know, above them, the judicial process, rules of evidence, so forth and so on. And this is where you get into the appellate processes and so forth and so on. So if it's easy, if you, if you're in an if you're in a court where their orders are subject to a judicial review, you are in a tribunal. Okay. Uh, advantages of the tribunal. Flexible is more adapting to changing circumstances than the court. Speedy and efficient. Avoids erroneous nature of 72's tenor. A judge will have tenor until they are 70. So if you need a number of determinations to be made in a short time, there is an advantage in choosing a tribunal. Appointed judges for a shorter period also indicates flexible flexibility. Disadvantages. No guarantee of independence and impartiality in decision making. As judges do not enjoy the security of tenor guaranteed under the Constitution, so members may be less independent. Deviating from the strict nature of the judicial process means the same degree of fairness may not be evident. Okay, so if you're in a in a forum where the rules are waived, changed, <laughs> and aren't followed totally strictly, then you're in a tribunal. Okay. So in dicta of judicial power, it is difficult to frame an exhaustive definition of judicial power and almost impossible to point to any essential or constant characteristics. RV, uh, RV versus Trade Practice Tribunal, ex parte, Tasmanian Brewers, Party LTD. So this is where they go over the details of all of this. And you can look up these cases if you want to get a more clear picture. Brandy versus Human Rights is a good one. Uh, Brandy considered first limb of Boilermakers. Issue whether binding or and authoritative. And it held that SS of 25 of the Racial Discrimination Act 1975 purported to vest judicial power in the commission contrary to Chapter 3 of the Commonwealth Constitution and hence were invalid. So what they're saying here is was the proper venue for a racial discrimination issue inside of the commission versus inside of an Article Three court? And the answer was no. So that act was invalid because the state didn't have power to vest in the judicial commission, right? So this can happen. I think we have a lot of statutes out there that we would be able to identify with on this particular issue, okay? Authority, binding and authoritative, unless subject to appeal de novo, indicates if a power is binding and authoritative, it must be judicial. Repugnance to first limb of boilermakers and therefore invalid by attempting to vest judicial power in a body that is not a chapter three court. Okay, so reiterating, if the power is binding and authoritative, then it has to go to an Article Three court to be heard. If it is not binding and not authoritative, it can go to a tribunal, which is why if you look at your statutes, you will find there is not penal code involved in a lot of them, right? So you don't get punished for failure to act or for that specific action because that would be putting it in the wrong place, right? So. They can't apply penalties in a statute that 
is being heard inside of a tribunal. So go ahead, read your statutes and you look yourself and you will find that most of that statute doesn't apply some sort of uh, consequence. They can't because that would be punishment and that would be a bill of attainder. That's why the statutes are open-ended and rebuttable, okay? Brandy considered bodies which are not courts, i.e. executive, vested with judicial power found invalid. The facts are found in various places, blah, blah, blah. Application of the Boilermaker's first limb. The judicial power of, of the CCH can only be vested in a chapter three court, including state courts vested with federal judicial power. Legislative usurpation is a consequence. So Parliament attempting to exercise judicial powers, an unusual in practice, must protect even small encroachments of the Parliament. Attempting to exercise judicial powers, smaller encroachments can lead to larger ones. I, can, I couldn't disagree with that more. That's why we have to keep an eye on our government. This is exactly what they're telling us here, is if we leave too much power to the legislation and we don't watch what bills they're passing, and I can tell you right now, there are several statutes on the books that are definitely, at, at bare minimum, at least uh, worthy of challenge for being a bill of attainder. If we're not watching these things, then we are going to suffer the pains and penalties of an existing bill of, of, of attainder. And then we're going to keep going uh, this direction. Our children are going to deal with this. Our families are going to deal with this. So it's very important to understand that if you're going to go to court anyway, you might as well challenge the statute on its face. You'd be doing your neighbors and families and friends a, a very um, big favor. <laughs> but, you know, if you got to be there anyway, you might as well might as well start looking at this a little closer. If, if you're in the a point of, you know, if you're up to a point of learning that you understand some of these things. All right. So will uh, a bill of attainer punishment by death or bill, uh, bills of pains and penalties, punishment by a lesser means, infringe the separation of judicial and legislative power as substitutes a legislative judgment of guilt for the judgments of the court exercising federal judicial power. Parliament attempting to interfere with the process of the judiciary by respectively amending laws to achieve a desired outcome will amount to legislative usurpation. And that's what we have a lot of times in a lot of our legislation is that the legislature writes the bills to suit a desired outcome and not to protect public safety and welfare. A great example of this, in my opinion, obviously, it's just my opinion, is the sticker that you have to get on your car. This does not have anything to do with public safety or welfare. Therefore, it's revenue driven. And yet I found statutes in the state code referring to stickers on a license plate no can do state because this is not a public safety issue. This is a revenue desired outcome. So this is something that we would want to challenge if we were in the court uh, with a ticket and our liberty was uh, infringed upon because they wanted to take money from us. Like they, that's not how it works. The only reason they would be able to detain us would be if there was some sort of public safety issue. Okay, public. So, <clears throat> Parliament cannot apply criminal laws retrospectively without an infringement of judicial power as they are prescribing the law and changing the standard that is applicable to an individual's conduct. But it is still the court who will determine if there has been a breach of the law. Detention, this word is nice, okay? The general principle. The involuntary detention of a citizen in custody by the state is penal or punitive in character and under our system of government exists only as an incident of the exclusively judicial function of a judging and punishing criminal guilt. Okay, so that's important. Detention versus arrest, you be the judge. Uh, the criminal act here says that you are arrested whenever you think you are. So if someone doesn't let you leave, you're arrested, not detained. Those are two different things, right? And I couldn't figure out why does it say that? And yet they always say, oh, you're being detained. You know, like, well, why don't you just tell me I'm being arrested? Because if I can't move, I'm arrested according to the act. Um, and this is why. When they say you're arrested, it's because they, they think that you've done an act that is subject to penalty. So something criminal in nature that caused injury. If they say you're being detained, it's because they believe you to be a danger to the health and welfare of the public or to yourself and they are detaining you in order to figure out if that's the case. Okay, so 
that's only a part of it. There are many cases that you can review when detainer is acceptable and when it's not. So typically if they are holding you for more than say five to 10 minutes, depends on your state, I think, but let's say 10 minutes is, is what it is here. If you're with them being so-called detained for more than 10 minutes, then this could be considered an unreasonable amount of time and therefore the detainment was unlawful, right? So we need to think about those things very clearly before we get involved with these people or pay attention, use your phones, record things, keep track of the time because that is something that can get your case thrown out and you don't have to proclaim to have any superior knowledge of some sort of big secret behind the scenes that leads to this big rainbow of money, right? Just doesn't make sense, don't do it. <laughs> All right, the Migration Act now requires an unlawful non-citizen who is present in the migration zone without a valid visa must be detained. There is no discretion exercised in this choice. It is determined by the parliament. It is therefore inconsistent with the principle that detention is exclusively judicial. Okay, so this is an abridgment uh, between the separation of powers. Legislative legislation doesn't allow for any discretion to be utilized. Therefore, it's authoritative. And being authoritative, it has no place in a tribunal. It has to be in an Article Three court. That's what they're saying here. Okay. If detention is to ensure that a person accused of a crime is available to be dealt with by the courts, essentially to the assure, ensure the smooth function of the judicial process, involuntary detention in cases of mental illness or infectious disease as it is imposed by the legislative to protect the community, not as a punishment of the courts, okay? If you get placed into a correctional facility, this is not punishment, okay? This is therapeutic for you and the community so that you can heal the relationship between you and the community. So the difference between going to a penitentiary versus going to a correctional facility. Parliament can punish for contempt of parliament. Military tribunals may punish for breach of military discipline. Detention for a legitimate non-punitive purpose can be authorized by the legislation. Negative consequences of detention will not make it punitive. It is the intention that is important. Harsh conditions will not make a non-punitive detention punitive. Detention will not be punitive just because it violates an international obligation. Detention will not be punitive even if it were indefinite. Saying, I can keep you in a correctional facility forever and ever and ever, but it's not a punishment, it's therapeutic. As long as the purpose of the detention is not to punish detention, can be authorized via legislation, okay? So basically what they're talking about here is intent. The state's intent to put, when they put you in the correctional facility, it is not their intent to punish you, it is their intent to protect the safety of you and the, and the public. And because no intent exists, we cannot say that the state is doing something criminal because in order to have a criminal case against the state, you would need to have intent to do harm, intent to abridge a right, intent to do all these things. And what they're saying here is that the state does not have intent to punish you, therefore it's not a bill of attainder because their intent is only to protect the public safety and welfare. Okay? Gotta really understand that, guys. If you don't really understand that, or if you're speaking to someone who's helping you who doesn't understand that, run, don't walk. Exceptions to the first limb of Boilermakers. The delegation of judicial function to administrative officers of the courts is permissible, providing it is limited and subject to the review of the courts. Parliament may punish for contempt of parliament. Military tribunals can punish for breaches of military discipline. Application of Boilermaker's second limb, a federal chapter three court can not be vested with anything other than federal judicial power. Okay, we're not gonna get too deep into that because that was kind of outside the scope and this is getting long. All right, so everything else in here is basically going over the same thing I've been telling you throughout the thing. It's just kind of a breakdown about public confidence, public safety, public health. Um, so before you decide to say things that the public may not understand, this is how you need to view it. If you're talking about a corporate system, you know, or a corrupt system, if you're going after them for all these different things, it would be wise not to mention those things if you don't have solid material evidence to support them. The kind of evidence that would be obvious for you to gain public support because the public will understand where you're coming from. If you are saying things that you feel the public just doesn't understand, doesn't know the truth of, and it would take them years to learn said truth like it took you, 
then it's not wise to raise it as an issue. It just doesn't make sense. So I hope that this helps clarify uh, for you not only what the courts are doing, but I think that this also is very helpful for you to be able to change the way you think as far as how you will address controversy when it's brought to you by these actors. That's the really important thing. We have to change the way we think. We have to change the way we react. And we have to change the way we hold ourselves out because of this reason. Okay, if the public doesn't know what you're talking about, then the court is not worried about you because all they care about is the court of public opinion. And as long as um, they can make you look crazy and say you're crazy, the public will believe them over you every time. So there's no reason to raise some of these really, really bizarre and um, aggressive kind of issues. It's only gonna get you in trouble. So I hope that you, you take a different path and start learning a little bit more about how things work versus what you want them to be. Everybody have a great day.